And we will wait another two minutes and then we'll just go ahead and get started. Oh, one minute. <laughs> Sounds great. All right. Well, thank you for uh, joining us today. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I am your host, Amy Gutierrez, and I have with me Linda Hall. Hi, I'm Linda Hall, I'm the program minister of Special Ed. And I am a specialist in ISD. And we're uh, here to talk about how to determine the difference between English language acquisition and a specific learning disability. It's good uh, to know. <laughs> yes. Um, and we we're going to have, you know, all of our guests share like one great success from this year. And since you are our only member so far, would you just like to share uh, with with us instead of in the chat? Sure. OK. And then at what school you're at? <laughs> Okay, I know sometimes it's easier to just go down and talk to somebody and then type it all out. Um, I currently split between Draper Park Middle School and Butler Middle School. I teach art foundations to like the sixth graders at Draper. And then I teach art foundations one here to the sixth graders and seventh graders. And then um, 3D design, which is mostly ceramics um, over at Butler. Oh, those are all the fun classes. <laughs> <laughs> and big. My ceramics class is like 37 students. Oh, that's a big, that's a big class. Mm -hmm. But they're having fun, so it's not so bad. Yes. I just, so at least they're interested. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thanks for everything you do. And thanks for being here today. Linda, did you want to share success, success from this year? Um, I haven't got fired yet. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good one and I think I can just to share a success I can share that same one <laughs> one success um I got hired on to Draper Park uh full-time so I cut 20 miles off my drive every day oh congratulations that's okay. great I'm like so excited <laughs> that's awesome uh one success I would say is just being able to um, work with Linda and other departments in support of our multilingual learners and 
I think that in itself is a great success. So I do too. I, I <laughs> echo that. All right, well, let's get started. Okay, we have our professional development norms as always. Um, if you would please uh, mute your microphone and turn off your camera if you're comfortable with that or turn it turn it on if you're comfortable with that. Um, if you have any questions or comments, um, you can please please type it in the chat or feel free to just um, ask as we go along. Okay, as always, what we'll be covering today and, and any bite-sized PD is tied to our MTSS framework. Uh, today, we will specifically be focusing on data for decision-making and team-based problem solving. Our learning intentions and success criteria. I am learning about the needs of multilingual learners and key look-fors in language and learning indicators so that I can make informed decisions. And I know that I'm successful when I can name and identify at least two differences between language acquisition and what I would be looking for in a disability. Okay, here's our agenda. We'll be cov um, covering, you know, what are the needs of our multilingual learners and how to identify them. Um, some key look fors. Um, when we're looking at learning indicators and whether or not um, one is tied to language acquisition or a disability, then we'll be going for um, through the steps for addressing those needs and then um, summing up with uh, any take some key takeaways. All right, so first of all, how do we identify the needs of our multilingual learners? Well, and really there's uh, three key things and that's doing a thorough review of their background. And this is, um, you know, getting to learn more about their educational experience, um, talking to their parents and um, just seeing um, if, they've, if, if they've attended all years through their schooling. And then um, how long they've been in the United States. Um, sometimes we get, we get students who have already been in the country um, for a few years. When they come to us, it may seem like they still haven't acquired enough language to be able to communicate with us, um, but they have been in the United States for a substantial amount of time. And so it is important to, um, to look for those things. And then what is their current emotional or mental state? And a lot of this can be a hindrance in their on their learning in general. Um, and this may be tied to them coming from like a war ridden country, you know, they're refugee students. Um, they could also, you know, just have um, come from a traumatic experience. Um, they still haven't lowered that affective filter anxiety that they feel and learning a new culture and language, um, moving to a completely different country. Um, so there are several factors to take into account that could be um, affecting their learning in the classroom. Um, Linda, was there anything else you, you think that we should cover and take into account here? Um, also looking if they come from another country and in that country were they on the IEP, um, did they have a disability identify in another country? So that would be something you would look at and ask parents too. And then um, if they have any documentation of that disability. Correct. And we may have some students who we consider um, SLIFE with students who have a limited or informal formal education. And they just um, may have, you know, some years that they didn't attend school for whatever reason. Um, and so then you want to ensure that you, you find all that out. Um, and if you if you ever need support in communicating with parents or your students, you can reach out to federal and state programs, and they can private, uh, provide interpreters for that. Okay, so what are some key look fors when we're looking at language acquisition and a disability, and those learning indicators? Okay, and we wanted to just start off with the science of reading, and this comes from um, the letters program. 
And Linda, did you want to discuss this? Yeah, the Starbird's reading rope. This is um, a rope and it's all about the what is needed to be a skill reader. And what how he describes this is that it intertwines with each other with language comprehension, with word recognition. And if you have something broken in this rope, and if you're going to look at a student and say, for example, they have no background knowledge, what are you going to do to build that background knowledge to help that student to become a skilled reader? So really identify those strands and look at what interventions are needed to be put in place to help that student gain those skills. And sometimes when you're looking at a student with a disability, they might have multi um, pieces of the strand missing and they have other factors that go along with it. So this is really dis dissect, dissecting what the student needs and having a plan to move forward. Thank you, Linda. And are we ready to move on to the next slide? Yes. Okay. Unless you have anybody, you have any questions about that? Okay. All right, so these are the key language differences that we are going to be looking at, and um, Linda mentioned some of them, and this is another resource that we are using, and it comes from the California Department of Education, and it's a practitioner's guide for educating English learners with disabilities. And in this um, resource, they document, you know, like the key differences in um, listening comprehension, speaking, phonemic awareness, reading, um, reading comprehension and vocabulary, writing, spelling, mathematics, handwriting, and behavior. And I've highlighted those one, those components or indicators that um, we're gonna be going over in our session today. All right, so with listening co comprehension, what if a student does not respond to verbal directions? Okay, and here are our key indicators for this learning component. Um, you know, with second language acquisition, students will lack understanding of vocabulary in English, um, but they may demonstrate understanding in their home language, or they may be able to demonstrate their understanding with an, a physical response or other type of response. Um, and it on average takes someone to acquire a language anywhere from five to seven years. And they may um, undergo like a silent period of even up to two years. So um, it could just be that the student is still um, acquiring the, the English language. But how do we distinguish that between a learning disability? Um, so a possible specific learning disability is students constantly demonstrates confusion. When you're giving verbal directions, in their home language and in English. So constantly the student is not understanding what you are asking them to do. And you've tried visual clues, you've tried giving it to them in their home language, you've tried English, and you have demonstrated that you have tried all these steps to help that student to understand. One thing you would do to rule out is you would do a screen, a hearing screening. Is there a possibility? Because some students have not been in school, like we said before, for maybe several uh, years or a period of time or have come from like a war zone. Is there a hearing loss that we need to roll out? We need to look at, is there any kind of physical impairment? Why the student isn't being able to follow through with these verbal directions? And then we might look at a processing deficit. Does that student have problems processing information? So those are things that we would constantly be looking at and um, with all the RTI things put in place for the student. Yes, thank you. Okay. All right, speaking in oral fluency, what if the student does not orally respond to question or does not speak much? Well, with our English learners, um, this is gonna take some time. The student could still be developing their expressive language skills and they will most likely comprehend a lot more than they can communicate at the very beginning. 
And so it's very important to um, to provide certain, you know, some scaffolds in there, um, some sentence frames, or give them uh, plenty of opportunity in the classroom to practice their language and to help them build confidence. So again, and with this one, a possible Pacific learning disability is when the student speaks little in the home language and in English. And students may have hearing impairment, processing difficulties, um, pronunciation. There's a lot of things that the student could be having problems with articulation. Again, you would always consult with the speech and language pathologist in your building. You could say, I have this student. I would just like you to come in and observe, give me some feedback. Um, they're always willing to do that, just to do a consult with you to say, um, yeah, this student possibly could have a disability or have you tried these scaffolds? So always go to that avenue of checking that out with your SLPs in your building. Okay, because I have a student, he, um, there's there's like no English because I taught in California and I, I remember having a lot of English language learners come in and an old school English yeah. language learner, right? Yeah. And so you'd always buddy them up with the, the my my Spanish speakers, if they were Spanish. Um, and then, so I've been, I don't have a lot of Spanish speakers in this class. So I've been doing, you know, Google Translate. I speak into it and then I'm like, okay, this is what I want you to do. So he's reading it. So I'm like, okay, so he's got comprehension. He's, he understands his academic language or most of it at least. And he'll type into it. So when he, I have him talk back to me, he won't talk into it. He types in and he's really soft spoken. Do you think, it's just because of his confidence level. It I could. Do, be. Mm -hmm. I do think it could be, and um, if he has opportunity to just practice even with his his peers, you know, you did mention that he is um, having that exchange or engaging with you. Um, does he practice, you know, with his neighbors? Mm -mm. And. <laughs> The two girls that I've got that want to sit with them, they're like, oh, do I have to? Yeah. And I'm like, girls, I'll pay you candy. Like, I'll pay you for your translating services. Just do me a favor. Do me a solid. Like, oh, oh my gosh. And yes. so they've kind of fallen off. So it, it's now it's me and Google Translate. And so I'm like, that's fine. I don't really care. As long as I can help them out. It's art. I can, right. I can role model and it's not that hard. Um, but I just didn't understand why he wouldn't talk into it. And so it, you, you think it's confidence. It could be confidence. And then another thing, a lot of time is our um, multilingual um, students, they only practice at school academic language. At home, they speak their native language, their home language. And so when they come to school, they don't have that confidence because they're not having that constant practice because at home, they don't have anybody to practice with. So they do get that whole self-esteem. I, I don't want to talk in front of it, somebody. Accent could be an issue. I mean, there's a lot of things, but it's somebody I would keep an eye on, you know, and keep some data on. And if you continue having a struggle, again, reach out to your SLP to have them come in, maybe give you a consult. Um, you could also, if you think it's more of a social emotional issue, you could have your social worker or your school psychologist at your building come in and do an observation and give you some feedback. So um, just use the resources you have in your building to kind of help you with that. Okay, because yeah, you're right. Confidence could just be the tip of the iceberg to a whole big other big problem. Okay. That and I sense. think, um, and this is middle school, right? So there's a lot of social elements coming into yeah. play here. And I think that that I, I taught middle school for several years, and that is a big contributor yeah, yeah. To, to whether or not they're going to, you know, show what, some diversion and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you can group, your students randomly sometimes to where he's not grouped with the same students who are speaking the home language where he's getting good examples of English. So maybe, you know, if one okay. student is does know the home language and then you pair them with somebody who is just English only, then that student can still just hear and get good examples of English and then that too will help. Um, and we've always made we we are, are making the recommendation too to have like just one phrase that they read um, aloud together as a class, um, and just getting them used to 
to that too. Well, like the learning intentions, instead of having one kid read it, I can have the whole class read it together. Yeah. Or even just bits and pieces, something like that, where he's not, the spotlight isn't necessarily on him. Okay. So. He's just part of the chorus, the chorus. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And it does build even just that one academic phrase a day. It does make a difference. Yep. Okay. I'll do that then. And I already know a group I'll move him into because he does look lonely with those girls. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh-huh. Okay. For reading comprehension, what if the student does not understand the passage read, although he may be able or she may be able to read with fluency and accuracy? And this is what they usually pick up on first. Um, so with the indicators of learning for that with second language acquisition is that um, the student may lack understanding and have background knowledge of that topic in English. Um, just like um, Linda mentioned, the cognitive um, academic language proficiency, they haven't developed it. It's the academic language that they're still acquiring. And so they don't have a way to access the contextual clues that may be in a passage. But you will generally see improvement over time. And um, just providing scaffolds with their reading as well, you know, visuals and breaking um, up the text for them helps. So again, a possible learning and disability could be students don't remember or comprehend what is read at home in their home language or in English. And if applicable, the student has received instructions in their home language. If this does not improve over time, there may be due to a memory or a processing deficit. So again, um, around reading, we also have what we call a tier two vision screener. So every student gets a vision screener. And if you are thinking of possibly a learning disability in reading and the student over time is still not making progress with all the RTI interventions that you are doing, um, you could talk to your school nurse about doing a tier two vision screener. A tier two vision screener um, looks at color blindness. Are they able to track words on the page? Um, it, it's more in depth type of screener. And this is actually required on, under the law if we're looking at Pacific Learning Disability under reading that a student has this screener done. So I always tell people, if you're in doubt, talk to your school nurse and see if this is something with a visual problem instead of a disability. Okay. Right, with writing, what if a student has difficulty generating a paragraph or writing essays, but is able to express his or her ideas orally. Um, if, especially for newcomers, I would say bypass having them write anything in, at great length unless they opt for it, doing it in their home language and possibly having them translate. But um, um, definitely giving them some sentence frames, you know, and, you know, an outline um, just to limit the lengthy writing pieces for the newcomers. But um, the indicators of learning for second language acquisition, um, they're still developing writing skills. And even though they may have well-developed verbal skills, they're always gonna get the social language first, which we call um, basic interpersonal communication skills. Um, they will make progress in this over time and you will see some patterns in the errors that they're making and it'll be simil to, similar to other English learners. So a possible Pacific learning disability, again, the student seems to have difficulty paying attention or remembering previous learned information. The student may seem to have a motor difficulty, avoids writing. Student may have attention or memory deficits. So again, looking at the student, you would do those RTI, those interventions. What is exactly those interventions are you trying over time and keeping data to figure out what is really going on with the student? Is it really a disability? Is it because of um, they've never learned and um, developed those writing skills? Those are all great questions. Attention, having attention or memory deficits. Again, if a student's been through trauma, because we do not know um, 
where their background is, we need to investigate that, know that, because trauma could be affecting the student too with their memory, um, ADHD. Another thing that could be just because you have ADHD doesn't mean that you have a learning disability. So there's lots of things here that you would dig into to see what is exactly going on with the student. And if you really truly believe that the student has a disability, again, look at your special ed team um, and talk with them about your concerns. Okay. And with regard to math, what if the student is unable to complete word problems? Um, an indicator of learning here with language acquisition, um, same on the, along the same lines, they're still developing that uh, mathematical language that needed. And um, you'll see that they will show marked improvement over time in their home language um, or in English. And I have a typo there, I'll have to fix that. Um, or with visuals. So possible specific learning disability here, students are not understanding how to process the problem in the home language or in English, even a significant period of time and in RTI interventions. Again, this goes back to maybe a reading disability. If we go back to the rope um, that we looked at earlier, you would see, is the student missing any of those components? And if they are, you would see this in math, being able to solve story problems in a math or understanding vocabulary because they don't have that background knowledge. So you need to really um, spend time getting those interventions in place, those maybe some accommodations in place. Maybe you'd look at, okay, I'm going to modify this assignment, see if the student maybe do a one-step story problem and be able to comprehend that. That would be an intervention. And then moving on to um, what is, can they do a two-step story problem? So you're always collecting that data. You're always trying new interventions over a significant period of time to see if they respond to those interventions. Okay, and with behavior, what if the student appears inattentive or is easily distracted? And those indicators of learning with that um, for second language acquisition, um, it just may be that they don't understand instructions in English because they haven't developed that language proficiency um, yet. And I always think of an example a colleague shared with me, you know, after, um, you know, several concerns coming up from a teacher that a student, you know, had some behaviors and wasn't um, following directions in it after, you know, a great length of time. Um, when she had gone in to observe, realizing that the student's name wasn't being pro pronounced correctly. And so then this was, this was the cause of that behavior. So once it was corrected, the, stu the student did start to um, engage more in class and follow directions. And then a possible specific learning disability is students in active, inattentive across environments when the language is comprehensible, maybe have an attention deficit. So again, looking at the student, does the student have a medical diagnosis of ADHD? How is this um, behavior impeding their learning? Would a, a 504 plan help the student with accommodations like um, breaks during the day, sitting in the front of the classroom, repeating directions? And could this student possibly have a disability? Just because you have a medical diagnosis of ADHD doesn't make you have a disability. You have to show how it impedes your learning um, and your academic process, progress. Okay, another behavior. What if the student appears unmotivated and or angry and may manifest internalizing or externalizing behavior and the indicators of learning for that with second language acquisition, again, it may just be that they don't understand it, the instruction due to their level of language proficiency in English, um, but it also may be that they're not feeling successful and they may have um, anger or low self-esteem or, you know, that confidence level to be able to speak hasn't developed yet, what, you know, what we were discussing earlier. 
So possible learning disability, again, student does not understand instructions in home language and in English across contents, may be frustrated due to a possible learning disability. Again, you need to be able to collect data to look at how is this impeding his ability to learn? And does this child need specifically designed instruction in this area? Um, again, looking at the RTI, what are you doing to help them with their behavior and, um, and their social emotional and what can be put in place? So again, I would say looking at your school psychologist, looking at your um, social worker at your school, getting input for them, maybe having them come to observe the student and put a plan in place before you look at um, child find. Hey, and what does the child find process look like? So child find process for special education is anybody can do the child find process. It can be a parent that says, hey, I suspect a disability. It can be a teacher. It can be anybody in the community. And what that do, person does is they come in and they speak to the counselor, admin, or other stakeholders in your building and say, hey, I'm concerned about my child or I'm concerned about my student. We have, have a history of doing tier one and tier two interventions. The student is still not being successful um, with the school could we're required by law to collect RTI data. So showing all of these interventions that we have done and the student is not making progress. And this is over a period of time. This is not something you do just in a month. This is over a period of time that you're collecting this data with it. You look at historical data. Does the student have a history of failure? Is there any medical diagnosis with the student? Is there um, any trauma that the student has endured and it's affecting their ability to learn or their behaviors? Once the team meets, your PLC, your department meetings, SIT team, et cetera, whoever those stakeholders are, then you can make that decision if you're going to move forward based on all the data to do um, start the special education testing or you might say, no, we don't have enough data yet. Or you might say, we want to try another type of intervention. So that's where it starts in the child find process. And you respond, letting the families know we're going to move forward with special ed testing or we're not. Once you've decided if you're going to move forward, you, then you're going to decide as a team, what testing are we going to need to be able to I call it dissecting, I hate that word, but trying to figure out what does the student need and where are they? So most of the time we'll do cognitive testing, we'll do um, parent interviews, we'll do student interviews, we will do um, academic testing, we will talk to teachers, we'll collect the RTI data, um, we do social emotional, we do adaptive, we might do motor, we might do that vision two screener. I mean, there's a lot of things that we might look at. This is a kind of child find once you get the permission to test. We have 45 school days to complete the testing. So that can draw out a little bit and it can be frustrating for staff who doesn't understand that. It's not something that happens overnight because as we know, testing takes a while. We also work with the ML department and they look at everything with the student too. Does the student get tested in their native language or do they get tested in um, English? So we get that feedback from them too. And so it, it's a complicated situation, but we really try to really figure out what does this student need and be able to move forward with that. Do you have any questions over child find? It's really quick. No, I was just going to say, I know you guys work hard and I know you guys are trying. <laughs> I recognize yeah. you. You're doing good. Thank you. 
Um, make sure that a possible um, referral consult with your instructional coaches and the I ISD specialists. Refer to your student support team. Meet with the parents again with an interpreter and begin the child find process if that's something you want to do. Consult with, we have teacher specialists here in our special ed department. Consult with them, your department chairs, um, your administration that's over special education if you have a concern for a student. So there's lots of people, your school psychologist, social worker, there's a lot of people um, there at your school that you can consult with that can help you through this process. Hey, so some key takeaways from our time together. And um, Linda, did you wanna go over those? Yeah, always work with your team and your key stakeholders and develop a plan of support. Um, make sure you're gathering and analyzing the data all the time. And then if you do need help from the special ed department in our middle school and high schools, it's Bethany Baker and Melanie Johnson. They're our high school people. Kat Nelson, we didn't put her name here, and Allison Roner is our middle school team. But you can always call the special ed department, call myself. I can help direct you in the right way. I get calls all the time. I'm happy to help teachers, general ed teachers, special ed teachers, parents, whoever I need to, to help point them in the right direction. And really, too, just making sure to identify that their student needs and providing those supports and scaffolds, you know, first before initiating the process. Correct. These are the resources that we used today. And you're welcome to take a look at them. They're linked into the slides. And that is it. Thank you. Thank you for attending. Do you have any questions for us before we leave? No, um, just thank you so much. Uh, it was very good. Really, really, really good. Um, the, the one about my student, I, I had a feeling it was confidence and I didn't even think about moving, regrouping him. And I'm definitely going to regroup him because he does look so sad and lonely. And I'm gonna move, as a group of kids, I think he'd be happy. And even if he's not like totally interacting back and forth, he can at least start picking up the language from the kids. All right. Yeah. So, well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for being with us today and spread the word that this is going to be um, available. We recorded it, so it'll be yeah. available on um, Canvas. Uh, <laughs> that place that we go. Yes. <laughs> so, that's right. <laughs> it's a long day. I'm ready. I yeah. know. <laughs> Me too. Have All a right. great day. Thank, Thank you. So you. Canyon View. You. Canyon View. It's on Canyon View. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.